after this, I will have my revenge over my dead body. Just now, Muthcat Circle Saber, the Flyer of Emptiness, claimed I will kill one way or another. All right, it's time. When it comes to the choice between banishing or compelling service from Gugo Ooze Burial, to Muthcat there can only be one option. Gugo Ooze Burial is to be our slave. Guzmo, you are bound to me. Yes, master. Ask him I shall obey. All right, now let's hold up a second here because in that moment of time, Gugo has charged forward and is now very close to Muffcat. And you can't see him, but he's behind this webbing right here, which he just sprayed out at me. This is critical right here because in the next moment, he is going to be at Muffcat. Now, I would just love to think that he is now under my control, but I don't know, maybe it takes a second to take hold. Having a look at the guy, he still uh, does not appear to be very friendly at all. He's showing us having no quarter, and he's not popping up in my companion tab either. Ah, uh, okay. Well, if we don't act quickly, that webbing is going to be all over Muffcat in the next couple of seconds. And if that happens, we are not going to be able to move or speak or anything. And if that happens, death is pretty much guaranteed. Well, we could try to compel service once again. Although it did not work the first time, and I don't see any reason why it would work a second time. I don't know why it's not working. Perhaps it takes a moment for the demon to become fully bound to me. I don't know. Of course, then the other option is to try to banish Gugo Ooze Burial. I think that's what we have to go with. We don't have time. Kusimo, the bond is broken. Return to the underworld and trouble us no more. <laughs> The monitor demon has vanished, right as it was next to Muffcat. I can tell because there's a giant puff of smoke here now, as well as a pile of many objects, all of its clothing and its artifact pike. Let's continue time forward a little bit here. Oh, you can see all the webbing spread out over Muffcat, and I am in fact webbed right now, as this smoke spreads out across the area, and then dissipates. That's it. Gugo Ooze Burial is no more. Bittersweet for Muthcat, I'm sure, because he had different plans for the demon, but the Eternal Realms will be much better off with the reign of Gugo Ooze Burial now at an end. Well, Elf, what the hell do you want? Help! Save me! Ooh, I have taken down five lions while stalking Kiss Wasp. What the hell is that, a threat? Are you threatening me? You idiot. <laughs> Guy, you don't even have any weapons. Oh, this copper scepter, right. No Sosnus gauze. All right, you. Drop no Sosnus gauze. Uh, oh, over my dead body. Uh, suit yourself. Get over here, you little bastard. You're not getting away. Where'd you go? Nah, here we are. Just running around like a moron. <laughs> Help! Save me! I must withdraw! All right, will you settle down here? All right, cool it, will you? Get over here. You're not getting by. Yep. Okay, there we go. You're a fighter, huh? <laughs> I am too. <laughs> oh. See? You might as well stop fighting. You're not going to win. I will fight no more. Good. Listen to me. The forces of Whisker Demons must pay homage to the Nazushem, or you will suffer the consequences. I will not bow before you. Okay. Do your scepter. Over my dead body. Alright, tell you what, I'm gonna take you up on the offer. Get back over here, you little bastard. Help! Save me! I must withdraw! Come on. <laughs> Perfect. Got stuck in Gugo's web. A metaphor made real. Gotta love it. Alright, now come here. You won't give it to me, huh? Suit yourself. It's gonna be mine one way or the other. I'm not really giving you a choice at this point. <laughs> you idiot. Hate to do it that way. I would have much preferred to leave the goblins with a cowed, fat elf poet as their leader. But since he didn't want to cooperate, it's what we had to do. Alright. 
Now then, we have a couple more artifacts to add to our collection. We have Nosasnaskaz, the Copper Scepter, as well as Kaslusspasnal, the Iron Pike, Weapon of Gugo Ooze Burial. And now that our task is done here, I suppose we can take a quick look around the place and see if there's anything else worth taking here in the Larval Castle. Shouldn't take long, I don't think. But it did take long. Very, very long. In fact, after he banished Gugo Ooze Burial back to the Underworld, Mufka, the Flyer of Emptiness, was never again seen in the Eternal Realms. None can say for sure what became of Mufka, but stories abound as to what may have happened to the powerful Nazusheb. To this day, he remains a hero in the eyes of the dwarves, but none can say for certain what he would have done if Gugo Uzburiel had come under his control. Would he have used the demon's powers for good or evil? Or perhaps something in between? It's impossible to know, and it will forever remain as one of the greatest mysteries of the Eternal Realms. Following the banishment of Gugo Ooze Burial, the forces of the Torment of Witches were thrown into a time of violent disarray. Civil war raged amongst the goblins as they fought over the right to rule the hordes. Blood flowed in every goblin settlement, from the lowest pits to whisker demons. Even in standard worlds, the goblin-infested former capital of the dwarves. With the dark hold of the goblins finally weakened, an age of suffering had begun to wane. But the vile grip of the goblins is not something that loosens easily. In time, new leaders would rise, and armies marching under the Grey Parrots would once again terrorize the Eternal Realms. But for now at least, the dwarves had a fighting chance. It's a strange thing to realize how a single individual's choices can affect change in the world. None of this story's events could be possible without first having been sparked by a rather unassuming being. Due to this one person's existence and the circumstances surrounding their life, the fate of the Eternal Realms has forever been changed. Arab Bursalab A remarkably unnotable dwarf born in the dwarven city known as Worked Fondled. Her youth was spent in the wide halls of protective stone deep within the stronghold, a fairly typical start for many dwarven children. Upon reaching adulthood, she participated in tournaments, married, and eventually became a baroness of the scraped chambers. Things were going well for the dwarf. Until, that is, a fateful visit to the human city of Velvet Gazes. It can't easily be said how or why it happened, but in her time amongst the humans, she managed to profane a temple of Hod, god of oceans, and was cursed for her sacrilege. Her soul was taken from her form, and yet she remained here in the Eternal Realms. No longer a dwarf, she would now prowl the night in search of blood. Arab had become a vampire. For some time after this event, she spent the nights stalking the streets of Velvet Gazes, always on the hunt for blood. Though this could not last, and eventually she was discovered and was forced to flee westward into the prairies where she remained for 70 years. Her tainted existence forced her into an animalistic mindset. She had become an unfeeling predator, a ghost of hill and dell. She existed in this state for many, many years, until one day a strange thing happened. Arab encountered a group of migrants. These dwarves, northbound, were far from the mountain home. A new fortress was rising, a haven hidden away in the pines. Aurel Zudan, Waterkeeper. Of course, 
Things didn't go very well for Arab and Waterkeeper either. Thus begins our story. Arab was imprisoned in the fort, and rumors of a vampire spread across the land. Upon hearing these rumors, the cultists of the Merc of Burying came together in Darkmine. Their plan was to steal away the vampire to use for their own vile purposes. Thankfully for all the Eternal Realms, Darkmine was unfortunately fated, and crumbled only shortly after its founding. And just as quickly as it had begun, the evil fortress of Darkmine fell. The cultists were gone. Yet a single survivor remained. A wild boar man. Moses Stizatragoth. Moses knew the plans of the cultists and set about turning them to his own will. He recruited a goblin spy, Snama's renowned horror, procured a few valuable treasures, and commissioned a money-making venture, a small fortress located along a brook in the eastern portion of the barricaded murk. The dwarves there would be called the Keeper of Bees, and from their humble fortress would come the finest mead, honey, and wax crafts. Their fortress's name would be Stetargusgosh, Honey Stoker, and this was the story of its rise and fall. Presently, it is Hematite, early summer in the year 308 and the fortress stands as a shadow of what it once was. The hives stand neglected, their once meticulous keepers now either lost to madness or bound in a constant struggle to keep their once prosperous home from dying. Long has it been since the mead stopped flowing. The joyous songs of the autumn festival will no longer be sung. The days of Stetargus Gosh's glory have passed, and the death of the fortress is inevitable. But it will not end. The legend of Honeystoker is undying. Not unlike the Nazusheb who dwell within its storied walls. Since the time of Moses' falling, it was agreed that once their task was complete, the Nazusheb would disappear from the world. The vampiric taint that gave them power must never fall into the wrong hands. But circumstances have changed. As madness grips Stetargus Gosh, true containment or eradication is no longer an option. For those Nazushebs still able and willing, the only choice lies below. In desperation, most flee, downwards, into the dark. Behind them lies a husk, home now only to muted shrieks and furtive shadows. The fortress of brown stone, once home to the Nazu Sheb, passes into legend. But while the story of Honeystoker has come to a close, the Eternal Realms live on, and its saga is unending. From here we depart from history and the present. To see what is to come, we must look forward, into a time which has yet to pass. After the fall of Gugo and of Honeystoker, the realm is thrown into turmoil. This chaos is a boon for the Scraped Chambers, who finally have a chance at resistance. Major Dwarven strongholds form both in the mountains to the south and to the north, where the fortress Waterkeeper lies. The northern dwarves, led by Silob, son of Id, know well the legend of Honeystoker and the Nazu Sheb. Thankful they are for the gift given to them by the much-feared fort. A gift from Nazusheb parents to the last remaining pure-blood dwarf in their line. The future of the Dwarven Empire is once again worth fighting for. But what of its saviors, the Nazusheb? Surely their story continues somewhere deep below, down in the lightless tunnels beneath our feet. If rumors are to be believed, Deep delving miners tell tales of spacious caverns and dark minarets far below the barricaded murk. Some believe the Nazusheb exists there still, in a hidden sanctuary apart from the surface. Nazushkusgosh, home of craft dwarves and warriors, heroes and horrors, life and death. Under the rule of their vampire king, the Nazusheb thrive. Shunned but respected by the dwarves, they remain in the dark, 
their goals unclear. Will they once again rise when forces threaten their surface kin, or do they lie in wait as undying conquerors? Only time can tell. But whatever the case, one would do well to remember that not all of Honeystoker's denizens abandoned their home. Lone wanderers traveling the eastern marshes tell tales of shambling figures and lights high in those forsaken towers. But worse by far are the sightings of a ghostly dark rider said to haunt the grounds. It's said that on cool autumn nights when the moon rises high, he can be seen, riding a ghastly black mare. Woe betide he unfortunate enough to cross the rider's path, for his skill is great and his mount cruel. As the sworn protectors of Honeystoker's halls, these sentinels ensure that the treasures held within this still mighty fortress remain unharmed. And so Stadharguskash and the Nazu Sheb linger on, dormant for now, waiting for their time to rise once more. Yet for one individual, the strands of fate remain shrouded. Atir Mamuztanam, once beloved leader of the Nazu Sheb. Downtrodden and disrespected, she fled from her home, seeking refuge in the fallen capital of the dwarves. She remains there still, amongst the squealing throngs of goblins, yet none can be sure of her purpose. What can the future hold for this resilient soul? Truly, the possibilities are as endless as they are unknowable. Yet Atir is a resourceful dwarf, and who could know what experiences she beheld through her years of meditation? Ifen is a kind goddess, and it might well be that the Verdant Mother has gifted Atir with knowledge. Perhaps now she stands poised to take advantage of the tumult that now rocks the Eternal Realms. But to what end? Who's to benefit from this situation? The dwarves? Herself? Or maybe the scion of Ifen has even grander designs yet to be revealed. Through time sweet as honey and troubles thick as blood, Honeystoker has endured. But at this time, its story ends. The Eternal Realms now stand at the brink of a new age. The age of dwarf and goblin. War will rock the land. But through this strife comes healing. And in some far-flung time, a time when the Dwarven clans once reclaimed their mountain halls, amongst them a secret will be whispered. A legend of triumph and woe, of heroes and monsters. The legend of Stetarmusgash, Honeystoker. However, peace cannot reign, for the legacy of Honeystoker is not without blemish, and unknown to all, darkness now grows deep within the realm. A bond has been broken, the hunt has begun. Stalking the fell plains of the underworld, his thirst for power is unquenchable. None can escape the flyer of emptiness, not even a demon lord. And once Gusmul is found, his fate sealed, Mufkat will rise, and the eternal realms will tremble.
Hey, how's it going, you bearded bastards? Well, there you have it. Yet another series all wrapped up. And another series that I should mention. It was not intended to be a full-blown deal, either. <laughs> yeah, it's looking like I've got a real problem with that. Although, I do not regret it in the least. I had a lot of fun making this series, and I certainly hope you enjoyed watching it. Now, I debated on whether or not I should pop in here at the end of the video, because I don't usually like to do this. Kind of break that immersion, you know? How often are you watching a movie or a TV show when the director pops in and is like, Hey, how's it going? But, um, hey, how's it going? <laughs> here I am. Now, real talk here for a second. When I had started making these videos back in 2016, which is a while ago now, <laughs> Uh, I had a lot of people straight off the bat telling me that I was eventually going to burn myself out by doing these. And truth be told, they do take a long, long time to put together as well. Believe it or not, each of those pictures you see probably takes, I mean, 45 minutes bare minimum, if not a full-blown hour, and I like to try to put 30 of them in an episode. And so, yeah, that's a significant chunk right there with just the drawing. And... Well, anyways, those naysayers back in the day that said I could not keep doing this, turns out they're all completely 100% dead wrong. I'm only going to stop making these when I am ready to stop making these. And that's not going to happen any time in the foreseeable future, I'll tell you that damn much. It's fun, I enjoy it. And I know how much you guys enjoy this too. And that means a lot to me. It really does. Um, am I getting rambly here? I think I might be getting rambly. I'm not very good at this off-the-cuff sort of stuff. Um, anyways, okay. Let's get to the point. Now, I don't often mention it because I don't like to be one of those guys, but as you just saw, I do have a list of Patreon supporters, all from my Patreon page. And I figured that since this is my job and I am a big boy now, that I should probably mention it every six months or so. And so here we are. <laughs> now, if you enjoyed this series and you would like to see me continue, well, I mean, I guess I'm going to continue. I already told you I was. But if you want to help support me and my family, and the channel for that matter, well, I'm going to tell you, a dollar a month goes a long, long way. Like a real long way. And I gotta say, I would be a forever in your debt. And I will be putting a link to that Patreon page down in the description below. Oh, and also I should mention, if you can't support me, that is 100% fine. 100%. Do not worry about it in the slightest, my dude. You still rock. You're the best. I love you. Alright? Anyways, okay, so I mentioned it. Oh, also, thank you for hearing me out. And until next time, you bearded bastards.